Question 1. Work out the value of 2 to the power of 4. Well, 2 to the power of 4 is obviously 2 times 2 times 2. That's 2 to the power of 3. And 2 to the power of 4 is there. So 2 times 2 is 4. Times that by 2 to get 8. Times that by 2 to get 16. So the final answer is 16. Question number two, write 7.26451, correct to three decimal places. That means three places after the point, obviously, so one, two, three. So we're looking at that four, and all we've got to do is look at the number that follows it. The digit that follows it is five. That five is big enough to push the four up to a five, so the answer becomes 7.265. Question three, part A. 7 times e times f times 8. Now, multiplication can be done in any order. So the easiest thing is to take the 7 and the 8 together. So 7 times 8, that's 56. And the e and the f simply have to be written as the f. So the answer is 56 ef. Solve x over 5 equals 2 and a half. Well, 2 and a half is a mixed number. So we're going to change it to an improper fraction. So we've got x over 5 is equal to 5 over 2. Now we want the x on its own. At the moment it's being divided by 5, so we times by 5 on that side and we times by 5 on this side. I'm going to write it here. So on the left hand side we've now got x and on the right hand side we've got 5 times 5 over 2. Now you'll probably remember that you've only got to multiply the top. So what you've got then is 25 over 2, and 25 over 2 is 12 and a half, or 12.5. Question 4. Write 4 fifths as a percentage. So we've got 4 fifths. We want it as a percentage, which means we want the value out of 100, because percentage means out of 100. So how do we make 5 into 100? Well, we times by 20. So if we do the same thing to the top, times by 20, we'll have an equivalent fraction. So 420s are 80, so we've got 80 out of 100, so that's 80%. But another way you might like to try this is to do the top divided by the bottom. Put two decimal places in, and a decimal point at the top. Five and a four won't go, so put a zero. So the four comes with us to make 40. Fives into 40 goes eight. Exactly, and 5 into 0 goes 0, so that's 0 0.80. 0. So we've changed 4 fifths to a decimal, and you'll probably remember to change a decimal to a percentage, you simply times by 100, which will give you the 80 again. Question 5. Work out 60% of 70. Well, 10% of 70 is 7. Simply divide by 10. So we want 60%, so we want 6 lots of 10%, so 60% must be 6 lots of 7, which is 42. There's our answer, 42. Question 6. Sammy spins a fair four-sided spinner. A, B, B and C. So there are two Bs. On the probability scale, mark with a cross the probability that the spinner will land on B. Well, there are two chances of landing on B out of four possible chances. And 2 out of 4 obviously simplifies to a half. So it says mark with a cross, so we'll put a cross just there. Part 2. On the probability scale, mark with a cross the probability that the spinner will land on F. Well, of course, there is no F shown on the spinner, so the probability is 0. So we'll put a cross at the 0. Question 7. Fahima buys two packets of bread rolls costing £1.50 for each packet. One bottle of ketchup costing £1.60, three packets of sausages. Fahima pays with a £10 note and she gets 30 pence change. Fahima works out that one packet of sausages costs £2.30. Is Fahima right? You must show how you get your answer. Well, let's see what we know that she spent. Two packets of bread rolls costing £1.50 for each packet. So two lots of £1.50 is, of course, three pounds. The ketchup was one pound sixty, so we know that she has spent four pounds sixty on the bread rolls and the ketchup.
Now, she had a £10 note and she got £30 to change. So if we add that 30p onto there, that comes to £4.90. So the amount that she spent on sausages is £10 take away £4.90, which is £5.10p. So I'm going to do the working out over here because there were three packets of sausages. We've got to divide £5.10 by 3. 25 goes 1 with 2 left over, which goes with that one. Don't forget the decimal point there. So we've got how many 3s in 21? There are 7. How many 3s in 0? That's 0. So that is pound seventy per pack. We have to answer the question, is the Hema right? No. A pack of sausages costs one pound seventy pence. Question eight. Work out five eighths times three quarters. Now you may remember that multiplication is the easiest thing you can do with fractions because you simply just do it. So five eighths times three quarters, you just, just do five threes of 15 over eight fours of 32. And that's the job done. 15 over 32. With subtraction, this is where you have to change the denominator to the same denominator, to a common denominator. So we've got two thirds take a quarter. So the denominator is going to be 12. So we're going to make two fractions with the denominator 12. Now, what have we done to the 3 to make it into 12? We multiplied by 4. So we have to multiply the top by 4. So that's 8 twelfths. And what have we done to the 4? We multiplied by 3. So we have to multiply the numerator by 3. So that's 3 twelfths. So now we can do it. 8 take away 3 twelfths. So that is 5 twelfths. Question 9. Sean works for a company. His normal rate of pay is £12 per hour. When Sean works more than 8 hours a day, he's paid overtime for each hour he works more than 8 hours. Sean's rate of overtime pay per hour is one and a quarter times his normal rate of pay per hour. On Monday, Sean worked for 10 hours. Work out the total amount of money Sean earned on Monday. So we know he's normally paid £12 per hour, but when he does overtime, it's one and a quarter times his normal rate. The easiest way to do that is to say, well, one times 12 is 12, but there's also a quarter of 12, which is three. So he is paid £15 per hour for overtime. So on Monday, he worked for 10 hours. Now we know that he did eight hours at 12 pounds. So we've got to do eight lots of 12, which is of course a 96. But he did two hours, because he did 10 hours, that's two hours more, so two hours at 15 pounds, and two times 15 is 30. Add those two up, and we find that he's paid 126 pounds. A farmer has 20 boxes of eggs and there are six eggs in each box. Write as a ratio the number of eggs in two boxes to the total number of eggs. Give your answer in its simplest form. Well, let's find the total number first. So the total is going to be 20 times 6. 20 boxes with 6 in. Well, two sixes are 12, so 20 sixes obviously 120. Now two boxes will have two sixes of 12. Two boxes have 12 eggs. So we want the ratio, the number of eggs in two boxes to the total number of eggs. So the ratio we're looking at is 12 to 120. The ratio is shown with two dots. 12 to 120, but now we need to simplify that. And you might be able to spot straight away that we can divide both sides by 12. So on the left, we're going to have one, and on the right, we're going to have 10. So the ratio in its simplest form is one to 10.
question 11. A sequence of patterns is made from circular tiles and square tiles. Here are the first three patterns in the sequence. So pattern number one has four circles and one square. Pattern number two has, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight circles and four squares. Pattern number three, you can see it's got four lots of three. So that's 12 circles and nine squares. So what I'm going to do is at the top here, I think I'll draw a circle, sketch a circle, sketch a square. And I'm going to put the pattern numbers here. So number one, number two, number three. In pattern number one, there are four circles and one square. Pattern number two, there are eight circles and four squares. Pattern number three, there are 12 circles and nine squares. And you might notice now that the squares are in fact square numbers and the circles are going up in multiples of four, four, eight, 12. So for pattern number six, let's see. Pattern number one is one four, two fours, three fours. So I think it's gonna be six fours. So pattern six, I'll put here, six fours. I think they're gonna be 24 circles. And pattern number six, well, pattern number one was one squared is one. Pattern number two is two squared is four. Pattern number three, three squared is nine. Pattern number six is gonna be six squared. Six times six is 36. So the question is how many square tiles? I didn't need to do the circles, but there you go. That's 36. How many circular tiles are needed to make pattern number 20? Well, we're looking at circles and it's one four is four, two fours are eight, three fours are 12, six fours are 24. So for pattern number 20, it's gonna be 20 lots of four, which is 80. So we can put that in there, 80 circles. And Derek says, when the pattern number is odd, an odd number of square tiles is needed to make the pattern. Is Derek right? You must give reasons for your answer. Let's look back then. So Derek says, when the pattern number is odd, an odd number of square tiles is needed. Well, let's have a look. That's an odd number. That's odd. That's odd. That's odd. So it looks like he's right. Yes, because odd times odd That's why he's right, because an odd number times an odd number will always give us an odd number. Question 12. There are only seven blue pens, four green pens, and six red pens in a box. One pen is taken at random from the box. Write down the probability that this pen is blue. Well, we need to know how many there are altogether. So seven add four is 11, and six makes 17. So we know we're gonna have 17 at the bottom of our probability fraction. And we're looking for the blue ones, so it is probability of 7 out of 17. 13. The diagram shows a tree and a man. The man is of average height. The tree and the man are drawn to the same scale. Part A. Write down an estimate for the real height in metres of the man. Well, an acceptable range for the height of the man would be anywhere between 1.5 and 2 metres. 1.5 metres is very short and 2 metres is very tall. So I would go for something like 1.8 metres. That's a reasonable estimate. And then part B, find an estimate for the real height in metres of the tree. So we need to look at the height of the man, which we've said is 1.8, and really compare that height to the height of the tree. The best way would be to measure that gap there with a ruler and then see how many times that would match to the height of the tree. And I think you'll find that it's about five times. So we need to do 1.8 times five. Now the easiest way to do that is to take the point out and do 18 times five. Eight fives are 40. One five is five, add four makes nine, so that's 90. But then we've got to put the decimal point back in, so that's 9.0. So it's nine meters is a reasonable estimate for the height of that tree. Year nine students from Halle School were asked to choose one language to study. 
the table shows information about their choices. Draw an accurate pie chart to show this information. Well, the first job is always to find out the total number of students. So let's add those up. So if we go down the units column here, six add zero, add four is 10. So we put a zero in there. And the tens column, five add four, plus that one is 10 plus two makes 12 so we've actually got 120 students now all the way around there is of course 360 degrees so if we've got 120 360 divided by 120 is of course 3 3 twelves are 36 so 3 lots of 120 must be 360 so 360 divided by 120 is 3 now that is the value of each student, three degrees, 56 students studying French. So what we need to do is 56 times three. Three sixes are 18, five threes are 15, add one makes 16. So that's 168 degrees needed to represent the students studying French. 40 times three, you probably know is 120, four threes are 12, so 40 times three is 120 degrees, so we need 120 degrees for Spanish. And 24 times three, well, we might need to work that out. 24 times three, four times three is 12, two times three is six, one more makes seven, so that's 72 degrees for German. And if you were to add those up, you'd find they come to the 360 degrees, which is what we would expect. Now we've got to draw the pie chart to show this, so we'll need to get a protractor. So you need to place your protractor exactly in the right spot. And you can see that the crossbar of the protractor has to go at the end of that line there. And then we can read round 168 degrees, which is there. So we've got a marker there that we made using the protractor. So now we're going to draw a line from the center out to our marker. And we now know that this section is the section for French. So let's write that in now. And that's 168 degrees because we measured it. So we put the protractor back on. This time we're making sure that the line that we drew just now is lined up with that zero there. The crossbar is right in the center and we're looking for 120 degrees. So if that's the zero, we're coming round there to 120 there. So 120, and there's a marker there. And now we need to draw a line from the center out to the mark that we made, which is there. So we measured 120 degrees. We know that this is the Spanish section, so we can write that in there. And of course, this one here is the German section. And you could, if you want to, check it by measuring that angle to check that it is the 72 degrees that we know we need for German. But there it is. That's a pretty accurate pie chart to show that information. Now, the next part of this question says, Year 9 students from Lowry School were also asked to choose one language to study. This accurate pie chart shows information about their choices. Shamina says, the pie chart shows that French was chosen by more Year 9 students at Lowry School than at Halle School. Is Shamina right? You must explain your answer. Well, Shamina is not correct. She might be correct, but we don't know that she's correct because we don't know how many Year 9 students there are at Lowry School. And so although it looks a bigger angle, it is a much bigger angle than the angle we had for French on the previous pie chart there may be fewer students at Lowry School and therefore there may not be more Year 9 students choosing French at Lowry. So we could write something like, no, as there may be fewer Year 9 students at Lowry school Dean here are a triangle and a rectangle the area of the rectangle is six times the area of the triangle work out the width of the rectangle 
Well, first job I think I'm going to do is to find the area of the triangle. Now, the area of a triangle is a half times the base times the height. Now we can do that in any order. So we could do half of the base. The base is eight. We could do half of eight is four times nine is 36. Or some people like to do the base times the height, eight, nine is 72, and then halve it. Either way, the answer comes out as 36 square centimetres. Now the area of the rectangle is six times that area, so we need to do 36 times six, and you might remember that actually that is six cubed, because 36 is six squared, and so six times six is 36, three six is 18, and three is 21, 216. So that's the area of the rectangle. So we know the length times the width gives us the area, so we know that 16 times the width will give us 216. So the width must be 216 divided by 16. Let's do that over here. 216 divided by 16. 16 into 2 won't go. 16 into 21 goes once with 5 left over. 16 into 56 goes Three times, three sixteens are 48. So we've got eight left over. And 16 into 80 goes five times. So the width of the rectangle is 13.5 centimeters. Question 16. D equals U plus AT. U is one, A is negative 3 and t is a half. Work out the value of v. So we've simply got to put these into that formula but then tidy it up. So v is equal to u which is 1 plus a t which means a times t. So we've got negative 3 times a half. So let's take that a step down. That's 1 and then the plus and the minus together will make a minus and the 3 is multiplying the half, so it's minus 3 over 2. So if you like, that's 2 over 2, minus 3 over 2. So that boils down to minus 1 over 2. So V is minus a half. Question 17. Five tins of soup have a total weight of 1,750 grams. Four tins of soup and three packets of soup have a total weight of 1,490 grams. Work out the total weight of three tins of soup and two packets of soup. Five tins of soup have a total weight of 1,750 grams. So one tin of soup, I'll just write one tin, weighs 1,750 divided by 5. So let's do that. 1,750 divided by 5. 5 into 1 won't go. 5 into 17 goes 3 times. 3 fives are 15, so we've got 2 left over. 5 into 25 goes 5 times. So that's 3, 5, and then a 0 there, because 5 into 0 is 0. So 1 tin of soup weighs... 350 grams. Now, four tins of soup and three packets of soup have a total weight of 1,490. So four tins weigh 350 times four. So let's do the workings out here. 350 times four. Zero times four is zero. Five fours are 20, so zero there, two there. Three fours are 12, but two makes 14. So that's 1,400 grams. Now we can see that the four tins of soup and the three packets of soup weigh all together 1,490. So we know that the three packets weigh 90 grams. And I think you'll see that therefore one packet of soup weighs 90 divided by three. which is 30 grams. So now we want three tins and two packets. So three 
times 350 and 2 times 30. 2 times 30 is very easy, of course, that's 60 grams. What about the 3 times 350? Let's do that just here. 350 times 3. 0 times 3 is 0. 5 threes are 15. 3 threes are 9. 1 more makes 10. So that's 1,050. So 1, 0, 5, 0. So all we've got to do is to add those two together. We've got to tidy it up and put them here in columns. 1, 0, 5, 0, 6, and 0 add 0 is 0, 5 add 6 is 11, 0 add 1 is 1, and 1 add 0 is 1, so we've got 1,110 grams. Question 18. Belina has a garden in the shape of a circle of radius 10 metres. He's going to cover the garden with grass seed to make a lawn. Grass seed is sold in boxes. Each box of grass seed will cover 46 square metres of garden. Belina wants to cover all the garden with grass seed. Work out an estimate for the number of boxes of grass seed Belina needs. You must show your working. Well, first of all, let's find out the area of the garden. The lawn is a circle, so we need to use pi r squared to find the area. Now, pi r squared is going to be pi times the radius squared. Well, the radius is 10, so that's nice. It's going to be pi times 100. And an estimate for pi that we can use is 3.14. So 3.14 times 100, which of course is 314 square meters. And that's a fairly good estimate for the size of the garden. Each box of grass seed will cover 46 square meters. Let's say that's about 50 square meters because we're allowed to estimate. We've got 314. You will probably remember that 650 is a 300. Well, we've got 314. We're going to need seven boxes because that's 14 more. 50 is more than is in each box. So we're going to need seven boxes. Is your estimate for part A an underestimate or an overestimate? Well, one thing we could do is to do 46 times 7, so get our estimate closer. 46 times 7, 6 7s are 42. 4 7s are 28, add 4 makes 32. So that would cover 322 square metres. We've got 314 square metres, so it's an overestimate. by about 8 square metres. Well, I think it is a bit of a crazy question, this one, because in a way it's not an overestimate or an underestimate. We know we're going to need seven boxes. Six boxes won't do it. Eight boxes would be far too much. Question 19, part A. Solve that little equation there. 4 into x minus 5 equals 18. Now, it's easiest with this one, I think, to multiply out the brackets. So we're going to have 4x minus 20 equals 18. Then we'll add 20 to both sides. So 4x equals 38. Then we're going to divide 38 by 4. So x is 38 divided by 4. Well, 4 nines are 36, so we've got nine, two quarters left, so that's a half, so nine and a half, or 9.5. Question 19, part B, there's the information we need. It says t is an integer. It says t is bigger than negative three, but smaller than or equal to two. So the possible values of t are not minus three, and of course it's an integer, so it's a whole number, so we can have minus 2, we can have minus 1, we can have 0, we can have 1, and we can have 2 because t is less than or equal to 2. So we're allowed that 2. So there it is, the job's done. Question 20. As Moll is paid £1,500 per month, he's going to get a 3% increase in the amount of money he's paid. 
work out how much money ASMOL will be paid per month after the increase. Well, the easiest thing to do is to start off with 10% of 1,500, and all we've got to do is divide by 10, so that is 150 pound. Now find 1%, so divide by 10 again, that's 15 pounds. Now find 3%, because that's three lots of 15, that's 45 pounds. So after his pay increase, he's going to be paid 1,500 plus the extra 3%, so 1,545 pounds. One, the scatter graph shows the maximum temperature and the number of hours of sunshine in 14 British towns on one day. One of the points is an outlier. Write down the coordinates of this point. So we're looking at the points there. All of those lie pretty much along a line, but this one is out on its own. So that's the outlier, and the coordinates of that are 10, 19, 10 on the x axis, and 19 on the y axis. For all the other points, write down the type of correlation. Well, you can see that you could draw a line of best fit through here, which would go something like that. So the type of correlation we would describe that as is positive. So we just simply need to write the word positive there. Positive correlation. On the same day in another British town, the maximum temperature was 16.4 degrees Celsius. Estimate the number of hours of sunshine in this town on this day. So we've got to look back at that graph and we're looking for 16.4 as the maximum temperature. So there's 16, there's 18, that must be 17. So 16.4 is going to be there. So if we go across to the graph, that's there. Go down to that, that's there. So the number of hours of sunshine would be 12.8. And we can put that in there. A weatherman says temperatures are higher on days when there is more sunshine. Does the scatter graph support what the weatherman says? Give a reason for your answer. Well, I think the simple answer is yes, because there's positive correlation between hours of sunshine and temperature. Question 22. Express 56 as the product of its prime factors. 56 and we can split it and you probably remember that 7 eighths of 56. Now 7 is a prime number so we normally draw a ring around that one because it's prime. Split 8, well that could be 2 times 4 and split the 4, so that's 2 times 2. So that you can see that we've got these as prime numbers. So we've got 2 cubed times 7. 2 times 2 times 2 times 7 will make 56. Question 23. Work out 54.6 times 4.3. The easiest way is to take the points out. 546 times 43 is the question to do. So we've removed the points. Now we'll start with the units. Six threes are 18. Tiny one there. Four threes are 12. Add one makes 13. Tiny one. Five threes are 15. Add one makes 16. Now those ones were written very small so that we don't get them mixed up in a minute when we're adding up. Now we're multiplying by the tens. So we put a zero in the units. Six fours are 24. Four fours are 16, add that two makes 18. Five fours are 20, add the one makes 21. And now we're going to add up the two answers. Eight add zero is eight. Three add four is seven. Six add eight is 14. One add one is two, add one makes three. Bring down that two, we've got 23,478, but Look back at the question. This one had one decimal place. This had one decimal place. So that's two decimal places altogether. 
So the answer comes out as 234.78, because we've got two decimal places to match the two that we started with. Question 24. The area of square ABCD is 10 square centimetres. Show that x squared plus 6x equals 1. So let's have a look at this square. If you look at one side of it, look at the top side there. The length of that side is x plus 3. And obviously the length of that side has to be x plus 3 because it's a square. And so what we do is multiply those together to find the area. Let's multiply that out. So dealing with that x first, x times x gives us x squared. x times 3 gives us plus 3x. So we finished with that one. We're now using the plus 3. So 3 times x gives us plus 3x again. And 3 times 3 gives us plus 9. So what we've got is x squared plus 6x plus 9. And we've been told that that is 10 square centimetres. So if we just simply put equals 10 there. Now if we subtract 9 off both sides, on the left we're going to have x squared plus 6x, and on the right we're going to have 1. So we have shown that x squared plus 6x equals 1. Question 25. This rectangular frame is made from five straight pieces of metal. The weight of the metal is 1.5 kilograms per meter. Work out the total weight of the metal in the frame. So we've got five pieces of metal. Two are marked with their lengths, 12 meters and 5 meters. So that one must be 5 as well, and that one must be 12. Then we've got this piece across the middle, the diagonal, and we need to find the length of that one. So this piece of metal is 5 meters. This piece of metal is 12 meters. But what about the length of that diagonal? Well, it's sitting in a right angle triangle, so we're going to use Pythagoras. So if we call the length of the diagonal, let's call it d, we know that d squared is equal to 5 squared plus 12 squared. Now 5 squared is 25, of course, and 12 squared is 144. And adding those together, we get to 169. Now you are supposed to know the square numbers up to 15 squared at least. And so you will, I hope, recognize that 13 squared is 169. The length of D is 13 meters. Now altogether then we've got 5 and 5, so that's 10 meters. The two opposites. The other two opposites, 12 and 12, so that's 24 meters. Plus we've got the 13 meters of the diagonal. So 10 at 24 is 34. Add 13, we've got 47 meters of metal. But we know that the weight of the metal is one and a half kilograms per meter. So we need to do 47 times 1.5 to work out the total weight. So let's do that here. 47 times 1.5. Now I'm going to do 47 times 15. I'm taking the point out again and putting it in in a minute. So 7 times 5 is 35. Four fives are 20, add 3 makes 23. Put a zero because we're tightening by tens. Seven times one is seven. Four times one is four. Add those two up, we've got five. Three add seven makes ten. Two add four is six, add one makes seven. So we've got 705 there, but we need to put a decimal point in. So it is 70.5 kilograms. Question 26. The equation of the line L1 is y equals 3x minus 2. The equation of the line L2 is 3y minus 9x plus 5 equals 0. Show that these two lines are parallel. So in both cases, what we've got are lines on a graph, and we've just got to show that they're parallel. Now you will probably remember that every straight line can be represented by this little expression here, y equals mx plus c, where m gives the gradient and c 
is the intersection with the y-axis. So m is the gradient. So the first line, line L1, y equals 3x minus 2, matches this because for m we've got 3 and for c we've got negative 2. So the gradient of this line is 3. So we can write the gradient of line L1 is 3. But now let's look at line L2. We've got 3y minus 9x plus 5 equals 0. And it doesn't look like that at all. But if we can make it look like that, we can find the gradient of this line. So the first thing I'm going to suggest is that we add 9x to both sides. So add 9x to the left-hand side and add 9x to the right-hand side. So on the left, we're going to have 3y plus 5 equals 9x. We've added 9x to both sides. Now let's take 5 off both sides. So subtract 5 from both sides. So now we've got 3y equals 9x minus 5. Now divide both sides by 3. So we're going to divide by 3 on both sides. So the left-hand side becomes y. The right-hand side becomes 3x minus 5 over 3. So the gradient of L2 is 3. Because this is 3 in front of the x and nothing in front of the y, just like up there. So the lines are parallel. We can write, if I can just fit it in there. And there we go. Now, question 27 is a vectors question. A, B, C, D is a parallelogram. The diagonals of the parallelogram intersect at O. O, A equals A and O, B equals B. Find in terms of B the vector D, B. Now, you'll know that the diagonals of a parallelogram intersect each other and cut each other in half. In other words, they bisect each other. So we know that DO is the same length as OB. So we want DB. Well, DB is actually made of two of those little b's. So the answer is 2B. That's the first one done. Find in terms of A and B the vector AB. So that vector there, I always think about how would I travel from A to B using the vectors that we've been given. And the way to go from A to B is to go from A back to O and then from O to B. To get from A back to O, we've got to go the opposite way to that. So we're doing negative A, and then we're going from O to B, so we're adding B, and so we would write that as B minus A. Find in terms of A and B the vector AD. So we're going from A to D. We're going in that direction, so we're going back along that A there and back along there. Now we know that DO matches OB, it's B, but if we're going in that direction it's going to be negative B. So to get from A to D we're going negative A, negative B. So minus A, minus B. And there's the job done. Thanks for watching.